The ring represents that material plane, the material world in which we live. The rod represents the connection that humanity has with the gods. It's the axis upon which the world turns. It connects the underworld to the earth and the earth to the heavens. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander F., and today we are so excited to learn about the Mesopotamian mystery tradition with Samuel David. Now, Samuel is a Mesopotamian polytheist, artist, writer, researcher, and educator based in the American Midwest, and he's stopping by to chat about his upcoming book from Anathema Publishing entitled Rod and Ring, an initiation into a Mesopotamian mystery tradition. And this is super important because I know that so many listeners might be familiar with the dynastic Egyptian magical tradition, or the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri, or the Greek, Islamic, or Jewish magical traditions, but what about the deities, rituals, and initiations into the traditions of Mesopotamia, a civilization that in many respects makes the ancient Egyptians look like newcomers? Sam's book, Rod and Ring, an initiation into a Mesopotamian mystery tradition, takes readers on a spiritual journey that combines traditional Mesopotamian praxis with a contemporary paradigm. And as a representative for Temple Sangamon, chairperson for the Council of Near Eastern Pagan Religions, and founder of the religious nonprofit organization known as Four Reeds, Samuel actively networks and collaborates with others to represent and protect the interests of those who seek to revive the worship of the ancient Near Eastern gods. So Samuel is the perfect person to shed light on the Mesopotamian mystery tradition and illuminate its praxis for us, while also discussing how this tradition compares to, say, the Solomonic tradition. Samuel also answers your Patreon listener questions. Thank you so, so much for those and for your awesome support on Patreon, and we discuss so much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome Samuel David. Samuel David, thank you so much for stopping by the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I uh, must say I'm appreciative of your staff for reading my contract because I did get the green M&Ms that I asked for. <laughs> along with my bottle of champagne and my red roses. So kudos to you, my friend. I can't confess to you all of the unspeakable things we had to do to get those green M&Ms, but we got the green M&Ms. So I'm I just... hope blood was shed. Uh, that's uh, all I asked for. Yes. In a ritualistic fashion, in accordance Perfect. with the instructions you sent last week. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Good to know. Now that we are fully sanctified and pleased, can you kind of take us back a little bit, Sam, to how did you first become interested in the esoteric or the, or the spiritual world? I mean, did you have a unique experience or, or was this a more gradual interest over time? Can you share a little bit about that? So I grew up in a charismatic Christian household, Pentecostal to be exact, but we did not handle snakes or drink strychnine. Uh, <laughs> which seems to be the common misconception for a lot of people when you mention Pentecostalism. <laughs> um, but I really feel just in hindsight that that made me more aware and perhaps sensitive to esoteric things. So while I do have that Christian background, there's also the education that I had growing up, the exposure to different cultures, different religions. My mom is actually Pakistani. I was born in Pakistan. I was raised there for a while. So there's this East meets West crossroads, liminal space, so to speak. So it's a lot of interest and a lot of different divergent practices, religions, cultures. When you were younger, especially like you say, you know, growing up in Pakistan, for example, did you come into contact with the esoteric tradition or a contact with spirits when you were a little bit younger or what was kind of going on in your earlier years? Well, I have a distinct memory. I was probably three, maybe four at the time. Um, I was playing in the driveway of our first family home. And uh, I remember just hearing people screaming and I look up. 
and I see a house engulfed in flames. I see people running around terrified. And I started screaming myself and my grandmother comes running out of the house and she picks me up and I kept pointing to where I saw the house and there was nothing there. And she kept assuring me that there was nothing there. So I think about that often. And I once shared that experience with someone else and they told me that I was having a glimpse into a past life, which I didn't really take that into consideration because I'm not one for wholeheartedly believing that we understand the width and breadth of any past life that we may or may not have had. But that is definitely an experience that has stuck with me since a young age. Were experiences like that, Sam, explained, encouraged, maybe not encouraged, but were they understood? Were they brought into kind of a larger paradigm or was it just, don't worry about that? Don't pay attention to that. How did that go for you? Well, it's interesting because I've had other experiences that are similar to that. My mother has had experiences, you know, when you when you're in that Pentecostal paradigm, spiritual interactions are not something that are completely ignored. I mean, they're looked at from a Christian lens. So you understand them through the scope of, of biblical scripture. You know that what you're seeing is either an angelic manifestation or a demonic manifestation. But there's also aspects of Pentecostalism that are derived from the teachings of the Apostle Paul, where the Apostle Paul talks about words of wisdom, where you're speaking things that you don't know, but are uttered, or you're speaking the utterance of the Holy Spirit, essentially. So, the explanation that was given to me much later was that I was seeing into the spirit realm something that did happen at one time, that the Holy Spirit was showing me for whatever reason, I don't know. But that was the explanation that I was given. And again, through a Christian paradigm in Pentecostal circles, that is not unheard of. I do find it interesting, though, that when I try to relate that to people who are in the occult community and the esoteric community, they tend to look at me like I'm trying to convert them to Christianity when (laughs) A, I'm not Christian, and B, do not expect me to convert you because that's not going to happen. To that point, Sam, I mean, someone like yourself who growing up, you know, part of your early childhood in Pakistan and then in the States in a very strong Christian tradition, that begs the question, how the heck did you first come across the Mesopotamian mystery tradition? It's funny that you mentioned that growing up, you're going to Sunday school. I'm going to Sunday school. I'm being the good little Christian boy that I should be. And in Sunday school, there's this big emphasis on the biblical heroes like Gideon, uh, Samson, you know, you name it. I knew it. I started asking those fundamental questions like, why are the Canaanites being slaughtered? Or why is Nimrod such a bad guy? And You know, when you ask those questions that run against or run contrary to what's taught, the answers are not exactly what you would expect. Usually the answers are, that's not for you to know, or you need to pray, or you need to trust the Holy Spirit, or this is something that we can talk about after Sunday school, which typically just ended up with my Sunday school teacher praying that God would give me guidance and the Holy Spirit would open my eyes to the truth of the biblical scriptures. So, there was no further discussion about the religious practices of of the other ancient Near Eastern people that interacted with the biblical Hebrews. I had to find that out on my own. Did you go to the library? Did you start delving into Mesopotamian history? Like, how did you first come across this? So, as a young kid, I got access to the church library. I also dug into my step-grandfather's collection of books. One of them is uh, Haley's Bible Handbook, which I still have a copy, my childhood copy. The information that's presented, of course, is written through a Christian lens. It's totally Christian paradigm. And what's interesting is a lot of the content is derived almost solely from the earlier writings of a Scottish free Christian minister. I think that's the name of the denomination, but by Alexander Hislop, who wrote extensively about Babylon, or at least the early conceptions of Babylon, 
and how Babylon inspired the Roman Catholic Church or was uh, fundamental in shaping the religious traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. So, he supposed, and this is actually something that a lot of people, including individuals in the neo-pagan community, they still believe wholeheartedly that Roman Catholicism is Babylonian mystery cult, and it's been hiding under our nose all this time. But that was my foray into polytheism. Granted, it was through a Christian lens, but it was quite insightful at the time, and I feel like it was instrumental in directing me in the direction that I am currently going in. As someone who grew up Catholic, I had no idea that it had these kind of deep mystery roots and people believe that about it. That's interesting. People believe it. But what's funny is it's been completely discounted. But if you try to explain that to someone who has like bought stock in the program, so to speak, trying to explain to them, well, this did not happen this way. And this is old scholarship, modern antiquity scholars and Assyriologists think this guy is full of crap. When you're so heavily invested in something, you're not going to divest yourself of that and look at things from a more, I don't want to say accurate point of view, but a more historical point of view. So at least in my own experience, it really does require a great deal of discernment when it comes to reading this stuff, because sometimes it conforms to some preconceived notions. Somebody is trying to establish what they've already made up in their mind. So they're looking to older academia, older texts that confirm their bias. And then when you show them more relevant material, it's like, "Mm, no, I'll pass. This kind of brings up, Sam, a question that I've heard from multiple people, which is, can you help us understand or share with us a little bit about What does Mesopotamia actually mean? Because I've been in conversations where people might use the terms Mesopotamian, Babylonian, and Assyrian, for example, interchangeably. And just they think that or they imply that it's just kind of all the same thing. Can you just give us some of the broad strokes of the various definitions or kingdoms or empires that were around? So we can thank the silly Greeks for naming everything. Mesopotamia (laughs) literally means between two rivers or between the rivers. So it's encompassing all of the cultures within the Fertile Crescent, primarily the Tigris-Euphrates region. So we begin historically with the Ubaid culture, which is circa 4,000 before Common Era, BCE. The Ubaid culture is then followed by the Sumerians as we know them today. The Sumerians were eventually assimilated into the population of the Semitic Akkadian people, So what's interesting there is the Sumerian people are a completely isolate group. There is no genetic ancestry that can be determined. The closest living descendants would be the Marsh Arabs of Kuwait. So they've been completely, historically, completely subsumed into the Akkadian population. But the Akkadian people maintained their spiritual legacy, their culture. They even maintained the language. So they wrote the Sumerian language, which was actually written and spoken well into the second century common era. So you've got the Sumerians who were then absorbed into the Akkadians. And then among them later, we have the swanky Babylonians with, you know, their rich garments and their oiled beards. And then after the Babylonians, we've got the dude bro Assyrians with uh, their brawn and military campaigns and terrifying murals that depict all the things they'll do to you if you step outside of their rule and, and regulation. So long story short, when people say Mesopotamian, it could be any one of these cultures. But if they're specifically stating, you know, Babylonian, more often than not, they're either speaking specifically to the Babylonian people, culture, et cetera, or they could be just referring to the entire region of Mesopotamia, but distinctly referring to those people as the Babylonians. I've I've come across both. And that actually leads to the next question, which is with your book, Order of the Rod and Ring, does your book draw from a specific Mesopotamian mystery tradition or a sp- like a Babylonian or an Assyrian or looks at various tributaries? Can you share a little bit about that? Well, my aim is largely to reconcile the various differences and harmonize the source material, essentially. 
So while I'm acknowledging each distinct culture's contributions and accomplishments, I'm looking for that common thread that is woven through every single one of those cultures because there's so much overlap. The Akkadians, being a Semitic people, they had a complementary pantheon, complementary myths, but they syncretized the Sumerian pantheon into their own. They referred to their gods by the Sumerian name. So it's all of completely interchangeable. And when you're referring to one, you're referring to the other. So when you refer to Enki, you're also referring to the Akkadian Yah, E-A is how you, you spell his name. Yah is how you pronounce it, which leads me down a whole other rabbit hole, but we'll get to that later. But yeah, my goal is to harmonize the source material while maintaining the distinct cultures, so to speak. So I will refer to the Sumerian myths that were codified by the Akkadian-speaking people. What's interesting is, while a lot of that work is written by the Akkadian people, it's the Assyrians who put the final touch on it. One of my books that I have is just full of Assyrian cultic ritual. So they take everything that came before them, they, everything that they inherited that they inscribed into their clay tablets and then fired. You know, we have those translations today. You were sharing a little bit about the sources and just kind of, you know, which specific areas and, and, and times that these sources came from. But can you talk about that in terms of the language and how the translation worked and, and how rare it is to have, say, a Mesopotamian mystery tradition text compared to, for example, like a lot of people are familiar with the PGM and with dynastic Egyptian mystery traditions and things like that. Can you share a little bit about the rarity of this and the language and just what do you what would you like listeners to know? So what's interesting is the notion that a lot of people have about the cuneiform language is unfortunately largely shaped by people in the community that strongly proposes that extraterrestrials intervened in human evolution and jump-started humanity to where it is today. So there's this idea that is circulated by this specific community that gives people the understanding that no one can read cuneiform, no one understands cuneiform. These are ancient tablets that only one person, Zachariah Sitchin, has been able to decipher. But there's an entire museum in Chicago, Illinois. There's an entire museum in England, the British Museum. I mean, there's these museums all over the world that have a seriologist that translate these languages. But within these texts, we have, we have the Sumerian language, which has its own distinct dialect that was spoken by women. So essentially, the women had their own language, which was also used in specific forms of myth where the speaker, i.e. a female speaker, would be speaking the role of a goddess or a priest would be using this dialect to voice the goddess. But anyway, getting back on track, these translations are available. It's just knowing where to look for these translations. If you want to find them, it does take a more detailed search, or you have to know someone who's willing to take time out of their busy day and point you into the right direction with one major academic website or another that few people would refer to unless they were in the field of Assyriology. Most of the books are published by like university presses. So if you want to get your hands on them, you're going to either acquire them through interlibrary loan, or you're going to pay a lot of money. Like I've, I've seen these books, they're limited run. So you'll probably get like maybe 300 published, which then end up shelved in a university library. So if you happen to get your hands on one, you're probably going to spend at least a hundred dollars, if not more. And once these books are outside of their publication run, you're probably never going to see them again for sale. Or if you do, somebody's going to jack up the price and you're going to end up spending $1,000 for a book that once sold for a mere fraction of that that you could pick up from the library bookshelf. And before we get to the order of Rod and Ring, can you just kind of, Sam, give us 
the broad strokes on the Mesopotamian mythos and the universe. I think a lot of people are familiar, of course, with the Solomonic quote unquote universe or the Greco Egyptian magical papyri and Egyptian dynastic mythologies. But when it comes to the Mesopotamian mythos, who were the gods? What is the creation story? Oh, gosh. So there's like 1500 plus gods. And a lot of them have overlapping traits. A lot of them have overlapping iconography. The primary gods were the seven who decree fate. So they're essentially the the great movers and shakers of the pantheon. So you have Inanna, who most people don't know about her. No, I'm kidding. I don't think she's a goddess that really needs much in the way of introduction, because as one of my friends put it, everyone loves Inanna. But yeah, if we wanted to go into detail about her, we, of course, can circle back to this later in our podcast uh, interview. So in addition to Inanna, we have her brother, Utu, also known as Shamash, to the Akkadian-speaking people. We have her father, Nana, who's also known as Sin, S-I-N or S-E-U-N, to the Akkadian-speaking people. We then have Enki, also known as Ya, to the Akkadian-speaking people. We have Ninhursag. She's the great mother goddess, so to speak. We then have Enlil, who is essentially the chief of the gods. And then among them, we also have An, who is the father of the gods, who essentially ceded his power to Enlil as his son to make sure that the universe is uh, doing what the universe should and that creation is doing what creation should. But Going back to your earlier question, though, so I hope I didn't mislead our listeners into thinking that, you know, these books are hard to come by. There are a lot of anthologies that have been published, thankfully. One of them is Before the Muses. That is one book that I highly recommend. It's quite easy to acquire from Amazon or A Books, but it's an anthology of Akkadian literature. It runs the gamut from history to myth, to ritual, to incantations. If there was a Bible that one could point to within the esoteric tradition, I guess that would that would fall into that category. But there's no Bible. That kind of, Sam, touches on when it comes to the gods, as you said, over 1,500 gods, what is humanity's role in relation to these beings? Yeah. So you've got the primordial gods, And then you've got the successive generations of younger gods. So it's the younger gods who in historical texts are referred to either as the Igigi gods, I-G-I-G-I, which essentially means those who see, who did all the manual labor for the greater gods, for the higher gods. And eventually they got tired of having to manage creation and serve the earlier generation And they organized a strike, refused to work. In the Akkadian version, this younger generation of gods actually threatens the older generation. They openly rebel, and a treaty is reached, decisions made to create humans that would provide the labor to maintain the earth, maintain the creation of the gods, which, according to the ancient Mesopotamian people, In order for mankind to be happy, they had to find the work that they did as meaningful. So essentially, humanity's role in the grand scheme of things, according to these myths and this historical understanding of humanity's role in the grand scheme of things, were essentially the tenders of the garden, were the gardeners of this garden of the gods that's been given to us to maintain. But in addition to maintaining the earth, We're also expected to provide sacrifices and offerings and praises and prayers and making sure that not only are their gods fed, but they're also spoken to. We do have a listener question for you from Maria that kind of touches on on all of these themes with the mythology. And, And again, going back to that theme about the rarity of this. And Maria says, hi, Sam, I can't wait to get your book. My question is, why do you think Mesopotamian mystery traditions are far more underrepresented in modern books and research? In other words, Maria is asking, why do you, Sam, think so much more, say, Egyptian material has been translated versus material from the Mesopotamian era? 
I think it's a compounded issue. I mean, there's a great deal of, of published research and translations. Again, the majority of these being circulated in academic circles. But I think that Egypt has an exotic appeal. I'm sure that if you mention the name Cleopatra to someone who lives in the States, the first thing that comes to mind is the image of Elizabeth Taylor dressed as Cleopatra in that film. You know, we have the Ten Commandments, the movie, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. We have the Prince of Egypt, the animated film that came out in like, I don't know, late nineties, early two thousands. But I think it's Egypt as a whole that has captured the imagination. You know, you've got pyramids, you've got hieroglyphs, you've got statues, idols, embalmed pharaohs. But I think that is something that has captured the, the imagination of, of readers. It's captured the imagination of members of the esoteric community. You know, we have Aleister Crowley, who, you know, really seemed to have capitalized on that. But as far as accessibility for Mesopotamian mystery tradition, I think the biggest challenge is if you go to, to any bookstore, you go to Barnes & Noble, you go to the New Age occult or neo-pagan section, a lot of that material that they have is more European-oriented. And if you're looking for anything related to Mesopotamia, it's either shelved under pseudo-archaeology or you know, somebody's got ancient aliens splashed all over the title. I've seen uh, select volumes that are, are written by members of the left-hand path community. So you have books like Michael Ford's Sabidi texts and some of his other work. You've got to Simon's Necronomicon, which was big back in its day. So as far as that's concerned, those are the accessible texts. That underscores too, Sam, just the importance of people who actually want to engage with this on a practical level. And the Order of Rod and Ring kind of offers them that path. And so can you share with the listeners about, Sam, the layout of the Order of the Rod and Ring and the goal of the praxis itself? What is the goal for someone who undertakes this initiation into the Mesopotamian mystery tradition? The goal of the praxis, when I started this, it was really to fill that God hole, so to speak. You know, these are the gods that I felt drawn to, the gods essentially of my childhood that I always wanted to know more about. So the deeper I became involved with this, the more research that I've done, the more I thought, you know, this speaks to me on a spiritual level. How can I take this further? So the goal of, of my praxis and, you know, hopefully the goal of, of the reader after they read my book, is to not only acquaint themselves with the gods, uh, but also establish a temple, either in a spiritual sense or in a physical sense, to keep that spiritual legacy of the ancient Mesopotamians alive and the knowledge of the gods relevant. Because believe it or not, the Sumerians, the Mesopotamian people as a whole, were all about innovation. So I'd like to think playing a little game of imagination, I'd like to think that if the average Sumerian priest were to look forward into the future and see that there are actually people that have revived the worship of their gods and are actually actively translating or working with academics to translate these texts, they would see that that spiritual legacy is relevant, that the gods of order, the gods of civilization, the gods that gave them the ability the comprehension to dig ditches and create irrigation canals and maintain fire and build the first temples. I really think that they would see that and know that their legacy is maintained and the gods who gave them these gifts are still relevant in this future society. I think, Sam, if I'm understanding you right, what you're saying is, you know, yes, you know, reestablish, go back to the old sources and keep the tradition alive but doing it in a way that is here and now and applying that engagement with the deities for issues and challenges and everything in the 21st century. Would that be somewhat fair? Yeah, absolutely. There's a writer, I cannot remember his name, but he says something along the lines of, you're not worshiping ashes, you're maintaining fire. And that is something that when I read that, I just thought this is something that, you know, so many people 
should focus on because there's this notion that in looking to the past, we have to do things the way the ancient people did. You see a lot of that in, in the reconstruction community, which I'm totally cool with. I you know, identify to an extent as a Mesopotamian reconstructionist, but at the same time, there's reconstruction and then there's reenactment. And I don't want to find myself or lead my reader into just mere reenactment. I want this material to be relevant. I want it to come alive for them as it's come alive for me, as it's come alive for those individuals that have shared this praxis with me, that have experienced these manifestations or perceived the presence of these gods. So that begs the question, how does one begin the praxis, Sam? For those people who are brave enough to start, how does one first become engaged with the gods or, or how does one first walk that path? So initially the book began as a primer. It was just something that I compiled all of my my own research, my own work for, and I thought, you know, why don't I put this into something that's more cohesive? And this guy that I know, I don't know if you know him or anyone else that listens to your podcast knows him, Jack Grail, you know, this total stranger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that <laughs> guy. That guy uh, <laughs> convinced me that I should put it out there. And so I approached one publisher who was interested and that didn't come to fruition, but moved on to bigger and better things. But yeah, the book began as a primer, more or less. It was a contemporary spin, as you know, we've, we've already discussed. But then from there, it developed another book and another book and another book. So the initial goal was to have four books, but compiling them all into one text seemed the best route to go. So the first book introduces the reader to the gods by way of the three pivotal myths or the three pivotal texts that describe that human interaction, that pivotal human interaction with the gods and how that's affected history, how that's affected our human understanding of the gods. So we have the flood myth, we have the myth of Adapa, and then we have a narrative about a king or Nama. So uh, the flood myth, of course, we're introduced to those gods of the earth in the myth of Adapa. Adapa is the only human who has ever ascended into heaven, has seen the face of the father of the gods, unknowingly passes on the opportunity to uh, acquire immortality for himself and for humanity. And then we have the final narrative, the descent of Ernama, who was a historical king, a almost mythological, mythopoetic composition uh, was written where it details his descent into the underworld him presenting his gifts, uh, his funeral gifts to these gods. Through that narrative, the reader is introducing themselves to the gods. They're becoming acquainted with the gods. And then from there, after the primer, the reader, if they choose to do so, has the opportunity to progress through the next parts of the book. So I initially set this up much in the way of an esoteric orders grades or levels. So in the first book, the reader is essentially referred to, instead of as initiate, uh, they're referred to as a supplicant because they're approaching the gods at their shrine. They're acquainting themselves with these gods. They're acquainting themselves with the methods and the means to communicate with these gods, what types of offerings are appropriate, what types of areas of, of influence these gods maintain. I know there might be listeners out there thinking who are very familiar with, say, the Solomonic grimoires, for example, thinking, OK, I'm about to start on a very long or detailed operation or ritual. They might be thinking of purity, prayer, fasting, ritualistic bathing. Can you share a little bit about the similarities when it comes to that and the differences? But when it comes to this issue of, yeah, purity and just preparing. Oh, yeah. So interacting with the gods, you're essentially interacting with the gods as though they were an honored guest in your home. So there's that ritual purity element where you have to bathe. If you're unable to bathe, at least wash your hands, but bathing, having clean breath. So that's something that I emphasize in the book, ritual, ritual bathing, ritual purity, brushing your teeth, 
I even in my own praxis, I actually have a soap set aside for this purpose that if I'm doing any ceremonial work, if I'm, I'm doing any ritual outside of a devotional praxis that would require a more direct interaction with usually the spirits that I, I interact with who serve as intermediaries between me and what I perceive to be the gods. There's a great deal of spiritual preparation in, in terms of bathing. Sometimes, if it calls for it, I will fast. The longest that I fasted has been for seven days, which is quite difficult to most who don't grasp it. But once you get around the fact that, you know, traditionally, historically, fasting, and this is something that, that is still maintained in Islamic traditions with Ramadan, fasting wasn't something that you did 24 hours a day. It was from dawn to dusk. So after dusk, you could eat. So if I'm in a position where I am able to fast, I will fast in that manner. But if it's a situation where I don't have that much time to prepare, there's been an instance where I've I fasted for 24 hours, didn't eat anything for 24 hours. But in the meantime, maintained ritual bathing, maintained ritual purity in the sense of you know focusing on certain things or reciting prayers. It's not unlike most people in our esoteric community are not familiar with. So a lot of this stuff should be familiar with, with my intended reader. When you were describing that, I, I definitely thought of the Egyptian priests, you know, in the Greco Egyptian magical papyri days who said, you know, if, if you've eaten fish or garlic, you cannot enter the temple cleanliness, really avoiding bad smells seems to yeah. be a really big thing. Yeah, it was all about smells. And what's interesting is, so there doesn't seem to be, at least from my own research, there doesn't seem to be any emphasis on dietary restrictions. So like in Islam and in, in Judaism, eating pork is taboo. The only time I've come across anything of that nature is as it pertains to certain cultic practices or certain festival practices. So like for one day or for one week, you are not to eat fish or you're not to eat pork. I didn't delve too much into that because I thought, you know, I, I don't want to go down that hole and be like, oh, hey, so while you're reading this book, you're not allowed to eat pork and you're not allowed to eat fish and you're not allowed to do X, Y, Z because I don't want to make something up off the top of my head and <laughs> lead people to think that I am an expert when it comes to dietary restrictions in the ancient world. That, Sam, begs the question, can you share with the listeners about the specific materia magica that, that you might employ or urge the readers to consider as they're moving through this praxis? Drugs. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> I'm totally <laughs> kidding. No drugs. Just say no to drugs. Drug abuse resistance education paid off. No. So with regards to materia magica, what's interesting is, and a lot of people, when I explain this to them, they think it's just totally insane. So what salt is to a lot of magical practitioners, flour was to the ancient Mesopotamians. So flour was actually employed along with holy water to create circles, to create magical boundaries prior to ritual workings. So in the course of the book, there is the opportunity for one to incorporate those ancient elements into a ritual praxis into a spiritual praxis. So in addition to that, you have juniper or cedar, two trees that were highly prized, valued by these Mesopotamian people. Juniper itself, its fragrance, its aroma, its actual smoke was said to pervade the halls of heaven and the depths of the underworld. So while there is no world tree in that sense, from a modern standpoint, if someone were to say, is there a tree that the Mesopotamians referred to as a world tree? I would point to the juniper tree and say, that's it. Because, you know, again, burning juniper branches, uh, burning resin from that tree was supposed to purify the space ritually, in addition to the magical boundary that is formed by flower and water. But it's also supposed to get the gods' attention. So if they smell something that they like, it's going to draw them to you. If spirits smell something that they like, it's going to draw them to you. So those are the three 
primary elements or the three primary materials that I recommend anyone get their hands on. And they're not difficult to come by. A lot of the juniper that I have is either harvested from my own backyard in my garden, or it's found in parks. It grows wild in, in Illinois where I live. So if you have a hard time, totally check out your local park. I don't think anyone's going to think twice about seeing somebody walk up to a juniper tree and cutting off a few small pieces and, and walking away. If you cut off more than that, they probably might say something. If communities across the world just start seeing juniper disappearing, and then a couple of weeks later, strange tablets are showing up in an ancient language, and there's Perfect. Ch- chanting at night, then we know that it's you. We know that it's, <laughs> it's the order of rod and ring, Sam. <laughs> he's gone through all the trees in his garden. He's baking more. He's got to get more. I think that is so great that you just empower the readers with this kind of set of tools and materia magica. And as you just mentioned, Sam, a few moments ago, there is no world tree per se, but after the supplicant has embarked on this process, is purifying themselves, is supplicating the deities to acquaint themselves with the deities. What is the next step? Uh, for example, you, you mentioned there's a descent into the underworld. Can you kind of walk readers through and listeners through the, uh, the next phase? So after orienting yourself in this, this world, so to speak, and engaging with these gods as a supplicant, you then move into the second, third, and eventually the fourth texts where you are moving outside of that role and into someone who's actually engaging with the world in a mythopoetic sense. So starting in the first part of the book, again, you acquaint yourself with the gods as the supplicant. In the second part of the book, you're actually moving into the position of a servant who is given the tools of civilization. So you're starting out in the temple, and you're making your way across the world, engaging with seven specific gods who bestow these gifts. So you have one God who bestows fire, which is supposed to symbolize, you know, not just fire in the material sense, but fire in the sense of, you know, inspiration and technology. You encounter another God who gives you the gift of strength, but not so much strength just as, you know, human strength, bodily strength, but also strength in numbers. So it's a progression from, early humanity grasping in the darkness for safety to humanity coming together as a community. Then there's the next God who gives the gift of abundance, which is the community coming together to, you know, shore up resources. So from there you progress into arts, humanities, eventually a name is given to you. Not so much, you know, just a name in the spiritual sense or in a, in an identifying sense, but also a name that speaks to your legacy that these gods who oversee the earth and and the aspects of human civilization give to you. In the third book that details the descent into the underworld, so just as one god has given one specific gift, another god in the underworld takes that away. So seven gifts given are seven gifts taken. A lot of the elements in That book that concerns the underworld descent, I've completely divested from the Jungian archetype. A lot of people, when they they think of the underworld, especially when it comes to Inanna's descent, there's this idea that you're descending to meet your shadow and having this startling revelation as you go through the the crucible and and engaging with the side of yourself. I'm, I'm totally doing away with that. I've led these types of rituals before, and... I've seen how, how invested people are in them, and that investment pays off in ways that they did not expect. So I don't want my readers going into this and having one of these types of experiences where they're just completely unmoored. You know, One notable experience was at Paganicon, and I led a descent ritual, and one attendee was so viscerally affected by that ritual that they crawled out of the room on their hands and knees sobbing. I don't know what happened to this person. I never saw them after that, but yeah, I don't want my readers to be in a situation where 
some sort of emotional or spiritual crisis happens and I'm getting hate mail or somebody's blowing up my inbox, my Facebook messenger. But yeah, so we engage with the gods of the underworld and instead of any Jungian archetypes or imagery, I incorporate a lot of esoteric wedding practices. So I'll let the reader take that how they will or the listener take that how they will. But I hope that when the book is in everyone's hands and they read through that portion, they're like, oh, this makes sense. So anyway, going through the underworld, coming out of the underworld in the final part of the book, you are revived in a ritual context and engage with the seven gods who oversee creation as a whole, who oversee the the turning of the universe. So you're interacting with the prime movers and shakers. And it's in this book, in this portion of the text, where you take on the role of the steward, the individual who is given the responsibility to maintain the legacy, the spiritual legacy, to establish a temple if they choose to do so, to officially declare themselves before the gods and before men and and women and humanity as a whole as the stewards of the gods on the earth. I wanted to completely do away with the notion that at the end of this, you're going to become a priest because I feel like that title has been abused. And, you know, someone coming from a Christian background, I've seen it in Christian circles just be abused. I've seen it in, in neo-pagan circles be completely abused. You know, you're, you're giving a title to someone, but with that title, the responsibility that comes with it is overshadowed by ego. So I don't want that title associated with this book. Does that make sense? If I'm understanding it right, Sam, what you're saying is your book is encouraging the reader to, through this praxis, approach it on its own terms. So even if they come from a a Christian background or, or any background, that they approach the book on its own terms and leave everything else at the door so that they can fully engage with the practice. Yes. Yes. And these, these titles, these terms, whatever are more or less egalitarian. So, you know, again, I don't want someone to come into this with this preconceived notion. Oh, at the very end of this journey, I'm going to become a priest because again, there's the weight of that word that tends to steer one in in one direction or another. So take the title away, give the responsibility of someone who is, to maintain the temple as a priest would in anticipation potentially of someone else coming into that position. Absolutely. Then maintains it going forward. So Sam, when you do become the steward, when, when you do go through this whole process, the way you're describing it, just an incredibly powerful process. What do the rod and ring represent, and what do they represent for the person and what do they represent in terms of the engagement with the deities? So historically, these symbols date to about the Sumerian Renaissance to the Neo-Assyrian period. They're commonly explained as a coil or measuring string and a yardstick. The best known example of the symbol is actually seen on the Code of Hammurabi Stella and a more elaborate description or depiction rather is found on another Stella dedicated to Erna Ma, the king that I mentioned earlier with his mythopoetic descent. These are essentially described as the tools that are possessed specifically by divinity. So if you're seeing a depiction of a being and they possess a rod and a ring, those tools, those markers identify the bearer of those items as a divinity. So with the rod and ring, the order of the rod and ring, it's, it's a play on words. You've got the order that is ordained by the gods. You've got the order in the esoteric sense. But from the practical standpoint, within the context of this praxis itself, the ring is actually the thing that binds the reader, the supplicant, the servant, the steward to the earth in the sense that we're inhabiting the earth. We live upon the earth. You know, when we die, our body returns to the earth. So the ring represents that material plane, the material world in which we live, 
the rod represents the connection that humanity has with the gods. It's the axis upon which the world turns. It connects the underworld to the earth and the earth to the heavens. Lots of imagery there. I didn't want to get too carried away with it, but as I was writing this book, as these ideas came to me even before I started this process, you know, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I saw these symbols and I thought, these just look cool. <laughs> what do they mean? <laughs> How can I eventually get my hands on them? But yeah, that is the long and short of it as far as the rod and ring and what they represent. Can you share with us about ritual itself? You know, for example, you describe that the descent into the underworld, the descending ritual. What are the key elements of ritual? Do they involve an employing of poetics, of trance, of altered consciousness? Can you share a little bit about how that works and, and how you lay that out in the book? So big shout out to a very dear friend, Andrea Habame. She actually created an ointment, a flying ointment, so to speak. Ooh. But it's supposed to aid in the ritual process as one descends ritually into the underworld. So, reader beware, if you use all of the ingredients, it will dye your skin red. But this ointment is actually supposed to be worn on the feet and supposed to facilitate or help facilitate this ritual descent. So, in addition to that being used specifically in, in the descent portion of the book, the primary focus is upon the intoned word and the repetition um, as well as ritual movement. So at certain points in the book, while the reader, while the supplicant, the servant, the steward uh, is reading aloud, they're to intone these words and at key points walk in place as though they were actually walking across the face of the earth. I know it sounds silly, but in the actual execution, when I've, I've led these types of rituals, People afterwards have shared, this totally took me out of, you know, it's like I was in a completely different headspace. But studies have shown, and this is actually something that, that hypnotists employ, intoning words is a method that is used to produce an altered state. If you're familiar, obviously, you are with the Catholic Mass. Priests intone throughout the Mass and a lot of other cultures, esoteric practices. The intonation of words is something that's employed either during ritual or ceremony, even in, in specific coming-of-age rituals. So, it's something that is found throughout the world. It is not exclusive to just this book. Can you share with the listeners about your first contact, your first engagement with these deities? How it happened, when it happened, that'd be amazing. Yeah. So, what can I say that doesn't make me sound like an absolute loon? because <laughs> I try to avoid the whole woo-woo aspect because I know that, you know, senses do fail us. Senses don't always capture what truly is happening. Our perceptions are changing constantly. One experience that I did have, however, which totally solidified it for me, trying to develop my own praxis years ago. At the time, I was solely focusing on Marduk, who we've got so much material for. We have the Babylonian creation epic. We have compilation of his prayers that an academic so laboriously compiled and translated. And I thought, well, this is what I have that's accessible to me. Maybe I should go in this direction and you know just see where this path leads me. And I thought of different ways to incorporate my spiritual background from my formative years. One of the biggest aspects of, of charismatic Christianity, one of the tools, so to speak, to engage with the spiritual realm is praise and worship. And that is something that I feel is largely missing from a lot of modern praxis, especially even in the neo-pagan community. There's, there's something about singing that connects us with the unseen. I don't know how to explain it. That's somebody else's job to explain it in a more esoteric manner. But I thought, you know what? I'm just going to take some of the songs that I love from my childhood and just change the words. So, I am in my car and I am singing a song that one would 
in a church sing to Christ. And the minute those words came out of my mouth, I kid you not, I heard a voice, a very audible voice, tell me, do not sing the songs devoted to another God to me. And I stopped, not stopped driving. I'm driving, of course. And I just stopped singing and throughout the rest of the drive, just sat in silence because, you know, things like that have happened throughout my life, but for it to happen in a very abrupt manner was completely life-changing. So it's completely changed the paradigm in which I'm engaging with these gods. And I still value my Christian upbringing, but that's not who I am anymore. And as fond as those memories are, that's a life I no longer live. So I have to look forward to to other things, other ways to engage with these powers, these spirits, these gods. Another experience that I had, this is another one that's wild. So when humans are engaging with the gods, historically, the Mesopotamians would refer to these sensations that would inform one that the gods or the spirits are near. The term is malam, M-E-L-A-M in Sumerian or malamu in Akkadian. And basically, it is the manifestation of these gods and the way that they appear to humanity or the way they are perceived by humanity is so powerful that we can't comprehend it. It's completely beyond comprehension. The only thing that we can comprehend is the way our bodies perceive these presences. And the perception of these presences is called ni, spelled N-I. So it's described as a prickling of the flesh, so essentially goosebumps. And other ways it's described as, you know, overwhelming sense of dread. So I am camping at Oak Spirit Sanctuary uh, in Missouri with, with some friends. And there's a big ritual to Hecate that's being led. And at the close of that ritual, I decided to go do my own ritual because, you know, my daily praxis is devotional ritual. So I leave the group that I'm with and it's at night and I've never been to this campground before, but the sky is completely beautiful. I can see the stars. I can see where I'm going in the dark. So I walk down this trail, which is essentially a a gravel road. And I come to a point where I stop and I prepare my offerings, my incense. And as I'm going through the names of the gods that I incorporate into my praxis, I get to Inanna, who is identified as a lion. She's described in leonine terms. The lion is her sacred animal. And as I'm addressing her in prayer, I suddenly have this overwhelming sense of dread. And I know that, you know, in my past experience, this is the presence of the gods being made manifest. So I'm like, I'm going to power through this. I'm going to finish my prayers. I'm going to pack up my things and go. I go back to the campsite and one of my friends asked me where I was. And I told them, you know, I just went down the trail, did my nightly devotional offering. And she told me, you should not be out alone by yourself because there is a mountain lion that lives in this area and has been seen more than once. So after she told me that, I was like, man, the American epiphany of Inanna was probably somewhere around me. And my sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth sense, whatever it is, that primordial human sense of fear in the presence of a predator must have kicked in. That's one of the other experiences that I think back on. And it's like, this is just wild. This is incredibly intense. Wow. I don't know about the listeners. I am getting goosebumps myself. I'm getting a prickling of the flesh just listening to this. And with those incredibly powerful experiences, Sam, did those directly inform the way you put together this book? Did it, did it inform the way that you structured the rituals and kind of putting together the different historical tributaries into one overall praxis divided up into four books? Or how did that direct experience, those direct, as Terrence McKenna says, the felt presence of direct experience, how did that influence the actual composition of your tome? That's a complicated question to ask. I just took what I do on a daily basis, wrote it down, put it in order, 
So I do incorporate these things, you know, the the intonation, the sing song aspect, and others again who have engaged in in these rituals with me in the same manner have had these same experiences. So my hope is that the reader, the supplicant, the servant, the steward who's reading this book has these same experiences. I'm very curious to know how others have felt the presence of these gods. I do know one person told me who attended a ritual that I led, she said that she felt a hand on her shoulder and it was a shoulder that had been injured during an auto accident, I think. And she said that when she felt that hand on her shoulder, that tension, that muscle tension, that pain that, that had been there had decreased. And, you know, just hearing that now in my current spiritual path, it was like, oh, you are speaking a language that I know from my childhood. So whether or not one has some sort of healing interaction with the gods, that would be amazing. I would love to hear from my readers and, and from the people who have read this book and, and have engaged with these gods. Do you recommend having some kind of esoteric journal or some kind of way of keeping track of these experiences? I know some traditions, there's like a consecratory procedure for a specific book, you know, like the Libra Spiritum. How can they maintain? How can they keep track? How can they take note? What, what would you recommend? I would recommend keeping a journal. You don't have to go through the motions to consecrate it. You know, I use <laughs> a composition notebook when I write my stuff and keep it simple. But I will say this, it's been my experience and the experience shared with me by others who are in this spiritual paradigm that what is revealed to us during these ritual experiences or what's revealed to us in our day-to-day -day lives shouldn't be something that is just readily shared. Uh, I guess that goes back to the fourth power of the Sphinx, be silent in your undertaking. Because there have been so many times where I've had an experience, an incredibly profound experience, and if you don't have that comprehension or that understanding that you know the gods were perceived by the ancient Mesopotamians as you know being very active in the material world, it's not going to be something that the person you're telling is really going to understand in the manner that you understand it. So keep a journal, write what comes to you. If you feel compelled to share, <laughs> don't feel despondent that the person that you're sharing with doesn't understand your experience or understand the paradigm. For people who go through this formal process of the order of the rod and ring, is this a process that they have to, or it's recommended they revisit certain parts of it, or is it working with the deities or engaging with the deities for further instructions, like the deities like this, or the deities would like that? Can you walk us through some of the long-term ways that they can engage in the praxis? So long-term ways, in a certain point in the book, there's elaboration on an historical concept where one interacts with their personal god and their personal goddess, and not so much a god in, in a big G sense, but one who is more concerned with your day-to-day -day life. So essentially, your holy guardian angel, except you have two of them. You see aspects of this in Islam where each human has an angel on their left side and an angel on their right side. But within the Mesopotamian philosophy, your personal God and your personal goddess oversaw your day-to-day -day life. If you had a relationship with them, your life would be exemplified by that. You wouldn't suffer hardship. You wouldn't suffer illness. You would not be in perpetual free fall living paycheck to paycheck. You would have resources that have been shored up. You would have the support of your community to see you through difficult times, which it's interesting because you look around today and you see a lot of people who are in perpetual free fall in your life. And I can't help but think, mm, did you piss off your personal God and your personal goddess? Because it kind of looks like that. But going back to the topic at hand, it's these deities that are concerned about your day-to-day -day life, your personal God, your personal goddess, that keep you connected to the big gods. I found in my own praxis, much in the way that Catholics would address prayers to saints to ensure that they would be carried to heaven, praying to my personal God and my personal goddess is something that has been 
incredibly beneficial because sometimes the gods don't hear our prayers. I know it sounds silly to say that, and people who don't have a spirit model when it comes to engaging with divinity, they may look down their nose at that. But I've I found that it's been quite affirming. So if I need some sort of, of divine intervention and I'm looking to Inanna or I'm looking to Utu or I'm I'm looking to some God who is outside of the human realm but interacts with the human realm by way of a personal God or personal goddess or even a spirit, you know, I will address my concerns to them knowing Hey, I know the person who who answers the phones. They're gonna let the CEO know of of my concerns, and maybe maybe I'll get an answer. During this initial process, going through the four books that are all contained ensconced in the Order of the Rod and Ring, you mentioned that at one point there will be a name given to the aspirant, a name given to someone going through this. How is that name? received is that in a in a dream vision is it received in a specific ritual and and then how is that name employed or used by the person throughout not only the praxis but after that so the name is given or has the propensity to be given in a ritual and at certain points in the text during these pivotal rituals the reader will say i am x and i have done xyz these are my qualifications. I have tended your sacred fire. I have, you know, possessed, you know, the things that you have given me. I've been your faithful steward upon the earth. This is why I am worthy. Now, if that name does not come to the reader, I actually have a ritual that I've employed and it is spot on. So it it essentially divines a theophoric name using of all things a clock. So historically, the ancient Sumerians created the sexagesimal numeric system. So units of 60 were employed during this ritual to divine the theophoric name that one is to refer to themselves with in a ritual working. If they were to go through this ritual, and I didn't codify it in the book, I should have, but that's neither here nor there the reader can reach out to me and we can do it together via zoom chat or whatever. I could travel the world to meet them, but the name of a God is assigned to a certain part of the clock. And then during the ritual, if they choose to go through with it, whatever time it is that the ritual stops is the time that corresponds to the God who oversees that hour and the theophoric aspect that falls within that minute. Does that make sense? I know trying to explain it, it sounds absolutely crazy because when it came to me myself, I was like, this is absolutely nuts. Nobody is going to buy this. Nobody is going to think that this is worthwhile, but it does work. It's definitely something that I would like to see employed. So if my listeners who end up buying this book have a challenge where they're not getting a name, I would definitely love to connect and we'll divine what your name is. We do, Sam, to that point, have uh, many listener questions for you. And the first is from Patrick M. Day, who is asking, how has Sam viewed the impact of Mesopotamian religion and cults on the mystery cults of Greece, if there is any? Patrick is saying, in particular... I'm curious if Sam has found any crossover into the mystery cults at Lemnos and Semothrake. So I'm familiar with Lemnos to a very small degree. It's the Kaberi gods. I think that's how you pronounce it. I understand that they are thonic or fertility gods, but they do also have an association with seafarers and, and ships. My thought there, though, is if there's any connection, especially since these gods are fertility gods and they're distinctly identified, as I understand it, as male, if there's any connection, it's completely tenuous. The two gods that do come to mind that could potentially be analogs would be the god Demuzid and the god Ningishzida, who are fertility gods who have phonic aspects. And I don't know where the seafarer aspect would come into play with those two. 
But it's definitely something. That is a question that now will lead me down another rabbit hole in my ongoing research. So one day, Patrick M. Day, I will be able to speak on that in more detail. But I can say that there is considerable impact on Hellenic myth and mystery cults. However, antiquity scholars and Assyriologists would frown on that because that leads one into the notion that there is some monoculture that existed in the ancient past, which so many people insist because of the comparative myths and stories. But we also know that culture was not stagnant. Trade routes were a thing. People did communicate. We find uh, Mesopotamian artifacts like lapis lazuli beads in Europe. So, you know, there were trade routes. There was an exchange of ideas. But anyway, what I found in my own research, especially with a manuscript that I'm currently working on, which I intend to pitch to Anathema once the Rod and Ring text is published, there is a the mystery cult of Adonis, the human lover of Aphrodite, which bears a great deal of remarkable similarities to the cult of Tamuts, the Semitic name for Demuzid, where gardens, little gardens were tended by women specifically who planted lettuce and if I remember fennel, because these were fast growing plants that in the heat of the summer would die, which would symbolize the death of this youth or in the Semitic sense, the God who would then resurrect. But yeah, there's so many similarities. You know, we have the motif of the jilted goddess who demands that a paternal figure exact vengeance or permit them to enact vengeance on the guilty party. We have the hymns of Enheduanna, who is, as far as we know, the first known female writer in history. She was a priest in Mesopotamia. She was the daughter of Sargon II, and she wrote a number of hymns that seem to have parallels in the Homeric hymns. There's also a great deal of parallels in praise poetry found in the Hebrew Old Testament. So it's a, a lot to dive into, a, a lot of rabbit holes to fall down when one looks at those trade routes and, and diffusion and assimilation. We do also, Sam, have a listener question from Azazel Piper, who is asking, my only question would be advice Sam has on a working praxis for those magicians interested in working in the Babylonian, Sumerian, and Canaanite systems and pantheons. Oh, buckle up. So, <laughs> contrary to popular belief, you do not have to look that far, although you do have to take advantage of interlibrary loan if you cannot afford these books, which I have done more than once. And it has been incredibly enriching, especially when the librarian doesn't even bat an eye when they see you copying pages <laughs> from, from a university textbook. But there are a number of texts that you can actually get access to. There's an author, Svi Abush. I'm going to butcher that name if I attempt to pronounce it again. But the spelling of the, the first name, T, Tango, Z, V, I, last name, A, B, as in Bravo, U, S, C, H. They wrote a book on Mesopotamian magic. That's actually the title, Mesopotamian magic. The second one is Mesopotamian witchcraft. There's another title, The Magical Ceremony Maklu. Maklu is spelled M-A-Q-L-U. They're also the co-author of the Corpus of Mesopotamian Anti-Witchcraft Rituals. There are two volumes of that book. So it's wild. These books exist. Here's the challenge, though. So in ancient Mesopotamia, magic religion, science, all of these divergent fields, they weren't separate schools. They were all considered essentially in the same current. So, you have the priest who is also the physician, who is also the magician, who is also the exorcist. So, if you, you know, had an illness, not only would the priest pray for you, but they would also potentially exorcise whatever was, was plaguing you. If you've got the time and the patience and want to head on down to your local library and get these books, 
feel free to do so. And if you want to hop on my website, rodandring.com, I actually have an exhaustive list of uh, recommended reading material, including these books. That is awesome, Sam. And we will make sure uh, listeners just to check out the video description so you can check out the roddenring.com uh, website as well. Sam, we have another listener question for you from Kevin Carlo. And Kevin is asking, how about the Sumerian and Babylonian influences on the traditions and pantheons of Greece and Rome? Things that, <laughs> yes, th things that maybe permeated the Indo-European cultures through trade and cultural cross-pollination. So one of my friends, the Gerard Butler of the Sumerian community, Steffi Von Scott, He's actually working on a very detailed book about Inanna or Ishtar. And others in the past, I'm sure, have, have written about this, but not to this extent that, that he's laboriously working on. But you see Inanna or Ishtar being essentially fractured into three separate deities by the Greeks. You have Aphrodite, Artemis, and Athena. Ishtar was or is, if you are a Mesopotamian polytheist or religionist or whatever you want to call it, the goddess of sensuality, like Aphrodite, sensuality, love, passion. You have Artemis, the hunter, Inanna or Ishtar is also a hunter depicted with a bow, depicted with arrows. A number of hymns refer to her in that sense. She's also the goddess of war, uh, strategic warcraft. Uh, so there's that aspect with, with Athena. So I don't know. Maybe the ancient Greeks were like, uh, just one goddess is too much to handle. We got to separate things, you know, whatever the case may be. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting parallels there. And then in myth, we have uh, successive generations of gods vying for control, committing the grievous crime of patricide. So you see elements of, of the Enuma Elish where Tiamat, the primordial mother goddess in the Babylonian creation epic, which by the way, was religious propaganda to legitimize the rise of Marduk over all of the other gods by his Babylonian priests. That's another story. But yeah, there's the successive generations of gods who vie for control and you know either fight and successfully bring the older generation to heal or slaughter them outright. So you know we've got titanic forces that are being controlled. And what's interesting is, you know, it's also easy to compare all of these ancient myths. So we have the god Enki or Yah, who in that Babylonian creation epic slays one of his progenitors, who is depicted as a dragon. And then later we have Apollo, who is a god of arts, who slays Python. Uh, we have Zeus slaying Typhon. There's a lot of interesting parallels, to say the least. Again, another rabbit hole to fall down. Speaking of historical connections, Sam, we have another listener question for you from Douglas of the What Magic Is This podcast. And Douglas is asking, I'm wondering if Sam can explain just how important the ziggurat was to Mesopotamian magic and religion. So the Mesopotamians believed that these temples connected heaven and earth. So they essentially served as the axis mundi. So there's that interesting parallel there. In fact, one of the ziggurats uh, in Babylon was known as, and I'm probably going to butcher this because off the top of my head, I don't quite recall the translation, but it essentially means the house of or temple of the foundation of heaven and earth in Sumerian. So it's a temen anki, a e. E is what precedes this word, but it's pronounced A, which means house or temple. So you have A temenananki, which again is the house or temple of the foundation of heaven and earth. So at the apex of the ziggurat was the shrine or a, a smaller temple in which the priests communicated with the gods and connected heaven and earth, so to speak. When people are going through your book and when they're engaging for the first time practicing the Mesopotamian mystery traditions, what are two or three things that you think people should always keep in mind when engaging in this process? Things that, that usually you really just want them to always kind of keep in the back of their heads when they're either reading or when they're 
practicing for the first time? It's a good question. I would say first and foremost, the nature of the gods is not historically bound by their myths. They define their myths, not the other way around. So for instance, you have the god Demuzid, who is both living and dead. He resides in the underworld, but he's also found in heaven where he he stands at the gates of heaven. Another thing too, Mesopotamian values and attitudes that concern civilization run totally counter to what uh, modern neo-pagans would espouse. So civilization is, is viewed as a divine gift. If you lived outside of the city or an organized settlement, you were essentially considered a backward savage. So <laughs> <laughs> embrace civilization and embrace those paved streets and those paved roads and, and those skyscrapers and well-manicured lawns and parks. Live in the now. Don't look to the past. Kind of asked in the negative, Sam, are there two or three things that you think people should not do or maybe two or three inaccurate things or misrepresentations <laughs> that you think people are always confusing about Mesopotamian history or Mesopotamian mystery traditions? Oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> this is where I get to court controversy and uh, hopefully I don't get canceled. So contrary to popular belief, Lilith is not a Mesopotamian goddess full stop. So I'm sure that's going to get me hate mail. She does have precedence in Mesopotamian philosophy, but more so in the sense that there are demons more or less called Lilu demons or Lil demons, L-I-L, who prey upon women who are pregnant, women in childbirth, infants, babies. Uh, they even prey upon men. They're the, essentially the embodiment of uh, infertility the embodiment of crib death. So, and then the other thing too is a lot of people have this this conception, and I've I've come across this myself when you know I've been told that the gods I worship are evil and that they're dark and scary, and I should look elsewhere. Which is interesting. It's it's like the esoteric equivalent of turn or burn, which is far behind me, and I I don't want to deal with that nonsense again. But. There's this misconception that demons were worshipped when really they were not the recipients of worship. They were the agents of the gods. So while demons, or as I prefer to refer to them as demons who possess the capacity to do both good and evil. So you, you have beings like Pazuzu, who is the god of plagues or a demon of plagues and the wind. So while he is a fearsome being that one would not want to be on the bad side of, he is petitioned by women in childbirth, by pregnant mothers to ward off these Lilu demons that would prey upon them. So you've got that interesting dynamic there that while these beings were not worshipped as agents of the gods, they did have the capacity to do both good and evil depending on what they were directed to do. So, you know, that takes me on another topic. So the gods are complete unto themselves. So there's no duality in the Western sense. So you have the God who heals, but also the God who can harm. So for instance, you have Inanna, who is referred to as uh, being fiercely forgiving. She's described in one composition as the lady of the largest heart. But she's also described as kicking around severed heads, dancing in blood, and you know, going back to demons being agents of the gods, dispatching demons to torment people who neglect their devotional duties that they have pledged to her. So if you see an owl tapping at your window, <laughs> that's probably a reminder that you should have said your prayers that morning and lifted up incense in her name. When someone goes through the initial four books of the Order of Rod and Ring and they go through that initiatory process, after they are doing that and praying to their and engaging with their personal god and goddess, do those demons or diamonds, do they have a tendency to kind of show up uninvited? Can people who pray to their personal god and goddess in the Mesopotamian mystery tradition engage with these Daemons separately, perhaps setting up separate altars, or is permission needed to be granted by their personal god or goddess? Can you just kind of walk us through some of those things? 
So what's interesting is, you know, the early conception of, of these beings, these personal gods, these personal goddesses in early art, they were humanoid, anthropomorphic. They resembled you and I. But later, they're depicted, and I actually reference this in the book as well, they're depicted as beautiful chimeric beings. So you have these winged bulls with human heads and these luxuriant beards and, and crowns. So they take on not just these day-to-day -day humanoid aspects, they also look like these terrifying beings, which biblical writers referred to in the book of Ezekiel as the cherubim. So they're referred to in the book as being threshold guardians. So prior to any ritual working, one can petition their personal god, their personal goddess in that aspect as these majestic chimeric beings to protect their, their ritual space. I will say in my own praxis, I do not have any shrines or altars set up for non-divine beings. I do have on my bookshelf, of all things, I have a statue of Pazuzu, you know, in that sense that he is an agent of the gods who protects one, should he be petitioned or should the gods be inclined to send him. But that's the only aspect of demonic work that I've, I've brought into this. And I have found that, you know, going in that direction of our conversation or answering this question, because he is in such a prominent space, whenever I walk into my temple and he is the first thing that I see, I have to acknowledge him or I feel compelled to acknowledge him because <laughs> there have been instances where I've just walked into the temple without acknowledging him. And it's almost like when you have your alarm system turned on in your home and you walk in, in the door and you don't enter your pin to deactivate the alarm. You're just walking about doing your thing. Suddenly the alarm goes off and you're like, oh my God, I forgot to do that. So in a sense, in an esoteric sense, he is my alarm system. I have to acknowledge that he is there before I then go into the temple itself. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave listeners with about the order of the rod and ring or any other advice or pieces of information that you'd like them to keep in mind? One thing that I, I will say that I want to impress on people who do anything in an esoteric sense, sometimes you're not going to get the answer right away. I think going into this when, you know, years ago, I was like, oh, I, I know exactly what to do. I know exactly how to approach it. And I'm going to get an answer and everything's going to be fine. That's the paradigm that I used to see the world in, you know, years ago, growing up in a Christian household that, you know, you name it, you claim it, speaking faith and, and that whole thing. But I found that as an adult going into this esoteric territory, you don't get ready answers. You're not going to have those immediate moments of epiphany where, the skies open and, you know, the gods speak to you in a, in a coherent voice. Um, I found that a lot of times the epiphanies that I'm expecting happen in my day-to-day -day life instead of during ritual. So if you're reading the book and you're not having the profound experience that you expect, don't let that discourage you. I think it's important to maintain a level head going into this that sometimes your answer is not going to be given to you right away. Sometimes it'll come to you in, in the form of a dream. Sometimes it will come to you in some random moment of synchronicity. I've had one instance where someone's relayed to me that, you know, they've been doing this, this one spiritual working and nothing's happening. And they happen to get the answer that they needed in the most unlikely of sources. So keep an open mind. For people reading and going through this praxis, when it comes to devotional hymns and devotional recitations, should people stick to kind of the classic texts or traditional texts? Or do you encourage listeners to compose their own devotional pieces that they can weave into recitations and devotional operations? Oh, I am all about working with the source material, but more importantly, making that source material relevant. So sometimes the hymns that you're coming across, you know, they're written by someone 
several millennia ago, they don't have the same concerns that you have. So by all means, adapt it, make it relevant to your life, make it relevant to your circumstances, what's going on. That ancient scribe who composed that one hymn, that fragments that, that have been found and had have been translated, they don't know your life. They don't know who you are. They're long gone. Even in writing this book, or even in my own personal work, you know, I started out reading these hymns, reading the traditional texts, tweaking it here and there, modifying it here where it didn't make sense, or again, it was not relevant to me. So by all means, whoever's listening and who, whoever will eventually buy this book, by all means, do your own thing. Take the, the open source software that I have, I have developed and, and go with it. What would you like listeners to know about where they can find out more about the book and about yourself? So pre-order the book on Anathema Publishing's website when that is available. Again, they're moving shop, changing, changing their location. So as I understand it, the forecasted uh, release date is June or July, June slash July, which interestingly enough coincides with a particular festival of a god that I have a praxis involving who is Demuzid or Tamuts. So that's that's pretty exciting if it comes out around that time. But as far as finding me online, I am on that thing called Facebook. You can find my Facebook page, Order of the Rod and Ring, which I allude to the book, but a lot of the stuff that's posted on there is actually the temple workings that that I do. I've got rituals that have been recorded that have been uploaded. You can also find me on Instagram, Rod and Ring, all spelled out. And then find me on Facebook, Samuel David. That's my name, my real legal name. You can also email me, Rod and Ring at gmail.com. Can you sh- give us any hints, Sam, on some future publications or projects or things that you're writing on you touched on this earlier but is there is there anything else you'd like listeners to know oh yeah yeah absolutely i am currently working on a book which highlights the historical mythological and spiritual impact of the god demuzid or tamuts which is also going to correlate to this book but primarily focus on the revival of his cult in contemporary society which interestingly enough in my research you know one would think oh he's just a god in in one myth who dies and takes an honest place in the underworld plot twist doing research on this book i found that he actually has a lot more accomplishments so to speak under his belt than than he's given credit for um, he's referenced in exorcism texts in medical incantations so be on the lookout for that uh, hopefully when I complete it, which my self-imposed deadline is in July, once that's completed, I will send it on to the Venerable Gabriel and hopefully it passes muster. Once that manuscript is complete, then I will be compiling all of my earlier research and existing written material concerning more dukes. So I've got my hands full. <laughs> It would be nice to not have to hold down a full-time job that pays for healthcare. Otherwise, I would be writing like a crazy fool well into the, the early hours of the morning. Mesopotamian polytheist, artist, writer, researcher, and author of the upcoming book from Anathema Publishing, Rod and Ring, an initiation into a Mesopotamian mystery tradition, Samuel David. Samuel, thank you so, so much for taking the time and stopping on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that chat with Samuel as much as I did. Speaking with Samuel was like traveling back in time to explore one of the earliest civilizations, some of the earliest recorded gods and goddesses, and some of the earliest mystery tradition rites and how people can approach the deities on their own terms. I especially appreciated Samuel's point about how important it is to show fidelity to the tradition, but of course adapting the aims, the needs, and the devotions that we have to our circumstances in the 21st century. So definitely check out the podcast and video descriptions for details on Samuel's book from Anathema Publishing, Samuel's blog, which is wonderful, and other information. And thanks to each and every Glitch Bottle patron on Patreon for your amazing support and your questions 
which as usual are a joy to ask and take the conversation in new and interesting ways. And if you'd like to support Glitch Bottle and get exclusive perks, please consider hopping on the Glitch Bottle Caravan at patreon.com slash glitch bottle. And as always, you can subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. As always, this is Alexander Eth reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Thank you.